Let me welcome everyone to this, as Ron mentioned, is the beginning, the overview of a series of panels we're going to do on, on uh, Richard Nixon's uh, domestic initiatives. Uh, Nixon, when he was elected in 1968, may have been the best prepared individual to be president in the last hundred years. Uh, he had been a congressman and a senator. He had been vice president for eight years. He had been a private citizen for eight years after that. Uh, but he'd been on the national stage since 1946. And he had lots of time to worry about national issues and what he wanted to do about them. When he was elected, the thing he didn't have, he had lots of goals, lots of ideas, but he didn't have very much institutional support. The Congress had been in the hands of the Democrats since 1932, and 80% of the congressional staff throughout that time were Democrats. The law firms in Washington were all Democratic. The uh, think tanks that existed in those days were all Democratic. It was a Democratic city. There had been people in the Eisenhower administration, but it was an older group, and when Richard Nixon lost to Jack Kennedy in 1960, the Republicans left town. So President Nixon had lots of ideas and lots of efforts to undertake, but he was going to have to do them with a very limited team out of the White House. Our story today is to describe how that came about, how policy making in the executive branch changed in the course of the Nixon presidency from cabinet government, where your leadership is in the cabinet and they propose policies, the president approves and then they execute, to White House policy making, where the White House generates the policy decisions and the cabinet uh, while well, they have input, executes. And that's the story here today. Uh, we have with us four members of the Domestic Council, four former associate directors, uh, 40 years after we were founded. And I'm just going to give you their names now. They're going to speak after, after I'm through and give you a little insight, an overview into three topics. Uh, next to me is Jim Cavanaugh, next to Jim is uh, uh, John Whitaker, and then uh, Dick Fairbanks, and they're going to talk about health care, environment, and energy, but give you a snapshot later on in the program, and I'll introduce them far more formally when we get closer to them. What we're going to start out with, though, is President Nixon's first approach on the White House staff to domestic policymaking. And, and we're going to deal with these five individuals and we'll end up with domestic policy making. But for now, we're going to start with Bob Haldeman, who was the president's chief of staff. Bob may have been the ideal chief of staff. Absolute control over the president's schedule and his reading. Absolutely non-ideological. Bob Haldeman didn't have to be there to, the, to tell the president what to think. His job, the way he saw it, and he was quite good, was to be sure the president got to make the policy decisions. The next panel, which is going to occur on President's Day in February, is going to give you a snapshot into the Bob Haldeman operation and how he made the best use of the president's time. And we have people who were there then at the time who we're going to talk about that in February. Uh, the next individual we're going to talk about is Henry Kissinger. Now, we've got three here that we're going to go through, and they're the three professors that Dick Nixon brought into the White House staff to give him different points of view. Uh, president Nixon was not only extraordinarily prepared to be president, he was not afraid or the least bit concerned about uh, different ideas. And what's interesting about these three gentlemen is none of them supported Dick Nixon's campaign for president. Indeed, Henry Kissinger, rather renowned and prominent Harvard professor, was Governor Rockefeller's foreign policy advisor. Uh, Arthur Burns, whom we will get to in a moment, was the great conservative ec economist. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan, another Harvard professor, had been in both the Kennedy and the Johnson administrations. But let's stick with, with uh, Henry Kissinger just for a second. 
Henry Kissinger was appointed assistant to the president for national security affairs, and he ran the National Security Council. The National Security Council is important to us today, not because it had anything to do with domestic affairs, but because it's the model for the domestic council. Now, what was the National Security Council? Well, it was established in 1947 by the National Security Act that founded the Department of Defense uh, and created the reorganization from the Department of War and the Department of Navy and, and uh, combined the armed services into one department. It was chaired by the president. It included the vice president, the secretaries of state, treasury, defense, the heads of the CIA, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Henry Kissinger, the head of the National Security Council. Uh, the way policy was made may interest you. In foreign affairs, the president just doesn't wake up some morning and say, you know, I think we should make peace in Afghanistan. They have to coordinate with all of the intelligence and, and uh, defense and, and diplomatic agencies. And the way they do it, and I believe they have done it since 1947, is they do it on paper. There is a policy paper prepared. It's frequently classified because it has all kinds of intriguing things in it. And those papers are called National Security Decision Memorandums. And, and, and when there's going to be a formal review of policy, these NISDMs are prepared with input from all of these relevant people. Now, while this is the National Security Council, the staff, the National Security Council staff, is housed at the White House and, in, in our instance, is reporting to Henry Kissinger. And these memos were concerned with about four things. A succinct issue statement, what, what are we writing about, what is the foreign policy issue, the action forcing event, which is, why must I decide now? In Richard Nixon's case in particular, he was extraordinarily well known for preserving his options. And there was no sense in expending presidential authority and energy unless he had to. He didn't want to make decisions unless he had to make them because he wanted to preserve his flexibility and his options. So the second thing is, what are we up to? Why must we decide this? Options for consideration, what are my alternatives on this topic? and then recommendations from relevant officials. Now, the officials can be insiders or, or, or outsiders, but the president really didn't care what the members of the National Security Council staff thought. Their job was to fairly and fully present the views of the relevant officials, so the president was told what the options were, and what people thought was what, what his advisors thought he should do. And frequently on these memos, there would be a series of decisions. You know, your option uh, on this is put in 20,000 troops, 30,000 troops, 40,000 troops, and the president would initial his choice. And then that paper, which contained the president's decisions, was circulated within the government, properly classified, on a need-to-know basis, and that's how policy was made in the National Security Council. We go back, having highlighted Bob Holloman and Henry Kissinger, because now we're down to domestic issues with these three people, and that is not how policy was made before the creation of the Domestic Council. Uh, what Dick Nixon had was two uh, uh, very prominent, very thoughtful, very active professors who were dealing with domestic policy. Arthur Burns was, had been count, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Eisenhower administration. He was a, a formidable and renowned economist from Columbia University. And, and he was advising the president on domestic policy, but primarily from an economic point of view. He had as his uh, head deputy Martin Anderson, who was also from Columbia, and three or four other staffers who were appropriately conservative. Distinguish Arthur Burns from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Pat had grown up in Hell's Kitchen. Pat came from nothing and knew the welfare system he grew up with didn't work. And Pat is, is 
renowned today for his insight into the weaknesses of government policy. He and President Nixon hit it off beautifully. They, they really, really enjoyed each other's company, even though Pat Moynihan was quite liberal. Pat's staff was the counterpart of Arthur Byrne's staff, uh, except it was liberal. Stephen Hess was deputy, and he had four other associates with him. Uh, uh, Richard Blumenthal, who you've read about most recently, who is expected to run for the Senate uh, in the state of Connecticut as, as a Democrat. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, a liberal guy, but he was on Pat's staff back in 1968. Uh, Chris DeMuth, who went on to run the American Enterprise Institute. John Price, who now runs the Federal Home Loan Bank Board in Pittsburgh. And a draft choice yet to be named, Checker Finn. Chester Finn is a very prominent person today on educational issues. He runs a private think tank. So Pat's staff was a boiling cauldron of liberal ideas. And what would happen on any given topic, Pat was in charge of the Urban Affairs Council, the first attempt to duplicate the National Security Council. And Pat and his people would put forward proposals and suggestions on education or on uh, welfare reform, the famous family assistance plan. And Arthur Burns and his people would say why that would never work. And they would have meetings, and the meetings could occur in the cabinet room or kitty-cornered from the Oval Office in a room called the Roosevelt Room. And the two uh, uh, professors, I picture, this is slightly romanticized, would sit at either end of the table and roll cannonballs toward each other. <laughs> and you would get endless debates, but no policy. And President Nixon really didn't have time for this. I mean, it was his idea to bring in these different points of view, but it didn't work. And he got tired of going to the meetings, and so they were doing debates without the president even, even being there. Bob Haldeman asked his roommate, from UCLA who had been on the campaign with, with them, John Ehrlichman, who at that time was counsel to the president, if he couldn't start to attend these meetings and prepare legal memoranda that the president could react to. It's quite well known that President Nixon vastly prefer, preferred to make decisions on written material. He was put off by personal salesmanship. He didn't think that was a good way to make policy. Uh, in an oral meeting. He really wanted to see it and think about it in writing. So John Ehrlichman started doing these memos that said, well, here's really what the issue is and here's what your alternatives are. And over time, John became, evolved into the assistant to the president for domestic affairs and he utilized the former associate counsels in his office of, of uh, counsel to the president to help him to do that. Pat Moynihan, uh, excuse me, Arthur Burns was the first to leave. He left in February of 1970 to become head of the Federal Reserve Board. Pat Moynihan left uh, about a year after that uh, to go back to Harvard. Harvard has a two-year rule. If you stay away from Harvard more than two years, you lose tenure. And while there was talk about Pat becoming ambassador to the UN, at the time he chose to go back to Harvard University. Remnants of both staffs came under the influence and direction of John Ehrlichman. So that's informally what was going on within the White House staff. But there was another effort that was going on, and that was being run by what was called the Advisory Council on Executive Organization, popularly known as the Ash Council. The Ash Council's uh, uh, obligation to the president was like the, the Hoover Commission under, under uh, President Truman, to take a look at the organization of the executive branch and make it function better. And the Ash Council consisted of five very, very prominent and talented individuals. Roy Ash was president of Lytton Industries. You remember Lytton was headquartered right here in, in uh, Beverly Hills. Uh, they, uh, by the by, they put me through law school. I worked for them each summer. So I feel very fondly about Lytton Industries. George Baker was the dean of Harvard Business School. John Connolly. John B. Connolly, former governor of Texas. This is his first exposure to Dick Nixon. Frederick Kappel, the former CEO of AT&T. And Richard Padgett, the president of Cressup, McCormick, and Padgett, which was a very renowned 
uh, consulting firm. So you had these five prominent individuals tasked to look at the executive branch and modernize it. Uh, in fact, not much happened. It was appointed in 1969, in, in April of 1969, but nothing happened until the appointment of Walter Thayer, president of Whitney Communications, to be special consultant to the president. And he was appointed in June of 1969, and he hired the executive staff of the Ash Council. Murray Camaro was director. He was from uh, uh, Booz Allen and Hamilton, a consulting firm. And Andy Rouse, Andy was a deputy assistant director of the old Bureau of the Budget at the time, but he had come from Arthur D. Little, another consulting firm. And they put together the Ash Council over time between April 5th, 1969, and when it concluded its work in May, uh, two years later in 1971, they prepared 14 substantive memos making recommendations on changes to the uh, executive branch that would enable it to function better. Now here's what's interesting about the Ash Council. The library here, the papers coming out in June, have about 100,000 pages of documents on the Ash Council, uh, 49 linear feet. Uh, they have these memos and the background that went into the memos and the thought by this staff of, of what put this together. So you can trace the work of the Ash Council. And what they did, in a very nice way, they laid the intellectual and academic foundation for change. And what existed at that time is a law enacted, I believe, in 1939 that enabled the president to make changes within his own branch if the Congress didn't object. So you would propose a reorganization plan transmitted to the Congress, and it would automatically become law if it were not rejected within 60 days. I think it's roughly what we do with treaties today, roughly what we do with some other, with the base closings. You know, it's kind of an all or none on these things. Well, what were some of these reorganization plans? And I've produced for you the four reorganization plans submitted in 1970 as a result of the work of the Ash Council. And the first one, submitted in February, uh, February 9th of 1970, created the Office of Telecommunications Policy. It consolidated into the White House, into the Executive Office of the President, uh, the, re the responsibility for reviewing and, and, and staffing the President on making decisions on telecommunications. The one that's most relevant to us today is reorganization plan number two, submitted on March 12th, that created the Domestic Council, and it established the Office of Management and Budget from the former Bureau of the Budget. And we're going to come back to that in just a second. But the two others that were submitted in 1970, number three, submitted on July 9th, created the Environmental Protection Agency, which is, of course, near and dear to my colleague's heart. And reorganization plan number four, submitted at the same time, created the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also an environmental initiative. So what you have on here is a presidential proposal based on the work of the Ash Council uh, causing a change in this instance, in all four of these instances, well, in, 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 uh, in three of them, the, the consolidation of the analysis and policy making is into the White House itself, called the Executive Office of the President. In Noah's case, the last one, it's created within the Department of Commerce. We're going to focus on re reorganization plan number two, submitted on March 12th. Now, what's intriguing you can go back and read these things because they're in the papers from the president's transmittal message of uh, March 12th. Essentially, it says, the plan recognizes that two closely connected but basically separate functions both center in the president's office, policy determination and executive management. This involves one, what the government should do, and two, how it goes about doing it. My proposed reorganization creates a new entity to deal with each of these functions. It establishes a domestic council to coordinate policy formulation in the domestic area. 
this cabinet group would be provided with an institutional staff and to a considerable degree would be the domestic counterpart of the National Security Council. Separately, it establishes an Office of Management and Budget, which would be the President's principal arm for the exercise of managerial functions. The Domestic Council would be primarily concerned with what we do. The Office of Management and Budget will be primarily concerned with how we do it and how well we do it. Lays out rather clearly what the President has in mind. And then there's a, there's a couple paragraphs on the Domestic Council and one on OMB, and, I'm, and then I'll finish reading. This is on the Domestic Council. The Council will be supported by a staff under an Executive Director who will also be one of the President's assistants. Like the National Security Council staff, this, work, this staff will work in close coordination with the President's personal staff, but will have its own institutional identity. By being established on a permanent institutional basis, it will be designed to develop and employ the institutional memory so essential if continuity is to be maintained and if experience is to play its proper role in the domestic policy-making process. And then the concluding paragraph on the Domestic Council. Overall, the Domestic Council will provide the President with a streamlined, consolidated domestic policy arm, adequately staffed and highly flexible in its operation. It will also provide a structure through which departmental initiatives can be more fully considered and expert advice from the departments and agencies more fully considered. As clear as you can be that policymaking is being removed from the cabinet and the departments and consolidated into the White House itself. And the paragraph, the final paragraph on the Office of Management and Budget, while the budget function remains a vital tool of management, it will be strengthened by the greater emphasis the new office will lace on fiscal analysis. The budget function is only one of several important management tools the President must now have. He must also have a substantially enhanced institutional staff, institutional staff capability in other areas of executive management, particularly in program evaluation and coordination, involvement of executive branch organization, information and management systems, and development of executive talent. Under this plan, the strengthened capability in these areas will be provided partly by internal reorganization and will also require additional staff resources. Even in Washington and in uh, bureaucratic doublespeak, it was very clear what was, what was intended. And what happened was congressional debate, because remember, if it's not rejected, within 20 days it becomes law. And there was at that time, living in the Congress, the chairman of the House Committee on Government Operations, Chet Holifield, who was a, a congressman from the greater LA area. And Chairman Holifield said, well, it, it looks to me like you're breaking up our little game here, because we have all these bureaus, and the bureaus do something that we like, and they serve us a, a group that likes what the bureau does, and you establish what's known in the, uh, uh, in the, in the parlance, what is known as the Iron Triangle. Uh, that is a congressional committee that has jurisdiction over an operating bureau, the civil service in the operating bureau that learns they need to satisfy the Congress, and a special interest group that's benefiting from this operation. And those iron triangles don't respond well to presidential direction or, or change of policy. Uh, they, they don't need to because they've got this link. And what, what President Nixon had in mind was removing that policy function from all the way across government and on issues of importance to him moving them into the White House itself. Congressman Hollifield's committee didn't like the idea, and they voted on May 8th a resolution of disapproval, which is the way you reject the President's reorganization plan. And then something happened that had never happened before under this act, and I don't believe has ever happened again, although the act has been allowed to expire, so it may not happen again. 
the House rejected the committee's resolution by a vote of 193 to 164, thereby allowing the reorganization plan to come into effect. And there was, needless to say, between May 8th and May 13th, a full court press from the Bureau of the Budget and the White House to get the Congress to let the President run his own policy-making branch the way he wanted to. And in the end, it was successful. The Domestic Council came into being, along with OMB, came into being on July 1st, 1970, about 40 years ago. And the Council itself, chaired by the President, includes the Vice President, nine Cabinet Secretaries, tend to be the Domestic Secretaries, and the Director of the Office of Economic Opportunity, you'll remember at that time, it was Don Rumsfeld. So that's the newly created Domestic Council, which, with all respect, almost never met because it had such a diversity of interests. But the staff, just like the counterpart of the National Security staff, the staff was housed at the White House and their job was to analyze proposals for the President and the significance is shown on this slide. Modeled after the NSC, it coordinated and facilitated domestic initiatives just like the message of March 4th, of March 12th told them it would. And instead of NISDMs, it prepared white papers for presidential decisions. And those white papers contained exactly the same four things, a succinct issue statement, the, the description of the action forcing event, it could be legislation, it could be you're, gonna, you're giving a speech, you've accepted uh, to speak before the National Association of Manufacturers, you need to have something to say, here's what we think you should say. Uh, options for consideration, recommendations of relevant officials. Now the cabinet departments have input, but no longer control of domestic initiatives. And if you put this more vulgarly, which occurred at the time, was a wag who said, you know, if I were a secretary and head of a department, and I submitted a policy proposal to the president, and it couldn't get to the president without a cover memo from John Ehrlichman and his staff, I'd resign. But in fact, that's about what happened. Because what was going on before, and this is go back many previous administrations, the Department of Labor, just to pick something, had a great idea for workplace safety. I'm making this up, but for workplace safety. So they'd prepare the proposal, and the proposal would say, we're going to establish a bureau, and the bureau's going to have this responsibility, and, 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 and won't we all be great? But they wouldn't mention it to the Department of Commerce, and they wouldn't talk about the impact on industry because their only concern was worker safety. And what the Ash Council had said, and what, what President Nixon wanted, was to push that initial debate back out into the departments so they had to talk before it got to the president. So the president wasn't constantly asked to make a decision that favored one department, because it was written by that department, and never considered other alternatives. And the role of the Domestic Council staff was to be sure those memos were an honest presentation of the issue, and the president himself got the right to make the decisions. So that's, that's what we came to. But you can see what the difference this made. Because the cabinet secretaries no longer were suddenly deciding what they were going to do. The president was deciding, fully staffed, and then he had the Office of Management and Budget that got to oversee how that was being executed. And other people have different points of view, but I maintain that scholars may someday conclude the creation of the Domestic Council and OMB, the consolidation of policymaking into the White House itself, is the foundation for the modern presidency. Now, it lagged behind foreign affairs uh, by almost two decades. But it followed that same effort of consolidation, and it's true today. It's true today. Each president has had an assistant for domestic affairs, sometimes more important, sometimes less important, but the facility of analysis has remained. And then there's one other thing. 
That's a byproduct of this. When you start tracing back any national issue, we're going to talk about three today, healthcare, environment, and energy, but welfare or education or any of those issues, you can pretty easily trace them back through domestic council work to the Nixon White House, and then you can't trace it much further because if you go further, it was out in a department and it wasn't institutionalized and it wasn't rationalized on, a, on an even basis ac across the issue. So you have proposals, but you don't have coordination. So that's what we were, what we were about. We were the, the young and the free. Uh, uh, we were not public figures. We were not sent out to, to go in front of the camera to explain what was going on. <clears throat> we didn't really want people to be able to reach us, to lobby us, except people within the government to, to prepare proposals. But our job was to become experts in any given subject matter so that written materials could be forwarded to the president to be sure he was the one making the policy decision that it was executed. In short, Bob Haldeman's ideal on domestic affairs. Three more slides. Perhaps one of the reasons that our domestic council became so influential and such a success on policy initiatives, I mean, it didn't always pass, but the president's proposals today look very well thought out, very well thought out and very astute, even if they weren't adopted. One of the reasons has to do with John D. Ehrlichman. Uh, uh, John, uh, uh, as, as the head of the Domestic Council, was open to new ideas. And the Domestic Council staff was protected from outside influence. And John, of course, had access. He was one of three people, he, Bob Holman, and Henry Kissinger, who could talk with the president about ideas. The other, the other Nixon, uh, my view, that Nixon wanted the proposal on paper so he could analyze it like a lawyer. And he, remember, he preserved time in the afternoons to go to his hideaway office in the old EOB and think about problems. When he went to discuss them, he didn't want, really want to discuss them with advocates. That was, it was not a good use of his time. And he was put off by that. But he discussed, if you, if, you, if you peruse the tapes, he discussed them extensively with people that he trusted who didn't have an ideological point of view but could help him to come to a decision. And that's John Ehrlichman brought it. The original deputy was Ken Cole. And the original associate directors, Lou Engman, Ed Harper, Bud Krobe, uh, Ed Morgan, and John Whitaker. John's here with us today. He's the old man of the group. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Bud and Ed were both associate counsel in John's counsel's office, and they came with him. And I would, I, I would add this because you know, this is, this is uh, the danger you have when you have spokesmen who were there. In the battle of the cools, of who really uh, got the fun of doing important things, the members of the domestic council didn't see their names in the press, but they got the fun of facilitating what was going on. And it was a highly respected, highly professional staff. The second term uh, was Ken Cole as director in the beginning, and uh, uh, five other associate directors, Jim Cavanaugh, who's with us today, Michael Duvall, Dick Fairbanks, who's with us today, uh, Todd Holland, and myself. So you have 40 years after the Domestic Council was created, four at least, of the original team. Now, we, we have to add, because we're fair, there was also the Office of Management and Budget. And remember, they're responsible for execution. And they tended to be older. They tended to be business types, under, un, under President Nixon at least. And they tended to be financial. I mean, you know, if you were, if you were running an operation, you wanted chief financial officers watching and, and evaluating how operations were being run. So out of fairness, the original director is George Schultz, you know, who started as Secretary of Labor, and then headed OMB, and then he went over to run the Treasury. Uh, Cap Weinberger, and, and then Roy Ash, who's credited for inventing the whole thing, uh, backed up by a couple of very, very prominent deputy directors, Paul O'Neill and Fred Mallet. Now, that concludes my, my role was to deliver us from cabinet government to domestic policy making.
And now we, we get to hear from my three colleagues, uh, uh, Jim Cavanaugh on healthcare, Dick Fairbanks on energy, and John Winokur on the environment. And I get to pick up my notes because I'm going to really introduce them. These are uh, uh, not public figures, but very, very prominent people. Uh, Jim uh, has a Bachelor of Science from uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University and a master's and a doctorate degree from the University of uh, Iowa. And he was teaching at the University Medical School when he was attracted to come to work as Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Health and Education. And from there he was brought over to the White House staff, the Domestic Council staff, in January of 1971, and he became Associate Director for Healthcare. At the end of the, of the Nixon administration, he became Deputy Chief of Staff for President Ford, and he served under, under Dick Cheney. And then when he left the White House after Ford's presidency ended, he took a job with Allergan, which is a local company here. The head of Allergan is on the Nixon Foundation's board here today. Uh, and Jim became his top assistant. Allergan at that time became purchased by Glaxo, uh, excuse me, by SmithKline and uh, Beecham. And Jim evolved into becoming the president of uh, uh, SmithKline and French Laboratories in back east, where in Philadelphia, where I lived. It was fun to see him again. And then in 1988, he joined Healthcare, Venture, Healthcare Ventures, which is a very, very prominent venture capital organization specializing in pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. So really, from the start, teaching in medical school up, up to today, John's, uh, uh, Jim's interest is healthcare and healthcare policy. And if you, with all respect, he's very good at it. Now we're gonna introduce all three so they can stand up in due course. The next speaker is gonna be John Whitaker, the old man of the organization. John, John had a Bachelor of Science from Georgetown and then a PhD in geology from Johns Hopkins. And he, he, he worked uh, uh, as a geologist in, in his early career. And then after Nixon was elected, he became secretary to the cabinet. And when the cabinet stopped making policy and the domestic council came into being, he was associate director for natural resources, which is a good use of a geologist. After uh, the administration ended, he was really the first director of the Nixon Library that was, that was founded here, but John was the one who did the original fundraising. Uh, uh, he, he was an executive official with Union Camp, a paper company, and most recently he's been chairman of the Board of Rebuilding Together, which is a charity that repairs over 10,000 homes annually for the elderly poor and, and has 200 chapters operating in 47, 47 different states. Uh, we're really glad John was able to come and find his way here to be with us today. <laughs> when, John, when John left the, the Domestic Council staff in, in 1972, his place was taken by Dick Fairbanks. Uh, Dick Fairbanks uh, has his uh, AB from Yale, uh, he then he went on a uh, naval ROTC scholarship. He served honorably in the Navy, and then he went to uh, Columbia Law School. He graduated magna cum laude. He's just another lawyer, but <laughs> like like any good lawyer, he worked for Arnold and Porter. He joined uh, uh, the uh, you were at uh, yeah he was at, he worked for uh, Bill Ruckel's house at uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. Joined the Domestic Council from there. Uh, he was on the Domestic Council f through the. Uh, uh, Ford through the Nixon administration, and then he founded his own law firm in Washington, D.C. He came back into service uh, under uh, President Reagan. He was Assistant Secretary of State for Congressional Relations, and then he was appointed the rank of ambassador and was a special negotiator for mi the Middle East peace process, uh, and he became then an ambassador at large under the Reagan administration, went back into the practice of law, and then in February of 1992, he joined the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It's a Washington think tank. And ultimately, he became president and CEO of, uh, of uh, uh, CSIS. See, I did that with notes. Good. Now, I'm going to sit down. You're going to get to hear from each of the three uh, on the domestic council and how it worked on its issue. But I warn you, it's just a sample. It's just an hors d'oeuvre because each of these issues is the, is the subject of a future panel where we're going to spend two hours really talking about how that issue came about. 
with that, I turn it over to Jim. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, and uh, good afternoon. Jeff mentioned uh, Gavin Herbert and his wife, Nanetta, here. And we're always great to see you, Gavin. Always great to be back in Orange County and look forward to spending a little time with you in the days ahead. I'm very uh, pleased to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you about uh, President Nixon and some of the highlights of the innovation and some of the health policy things that he did. I'd uh, like to start with, as a backdrop, his 1971 State of the Union message, which he made in uh, January of that year. My colleagues will remember that he used the occasion of his 1971 State of the Union address to talk about six great goals that he had in mind for the domestic area. Welfare reform was one. He wanted to revise the welfare reform system as we knew it throughout the U.S. He wanted to work on full prosperity in the economy, particularly as we transitioned into a peacetime economy and a peacetime environment. He wanted to restore and enhance our natural environment, which you'll hear a little bit about later this afternoon. He wanted to strengthen and reform state and local government, and his primary vehicle to do that was through revenue sharing, and he wanted to complete the reform of the federal government and uh, eliminate some of the departments and agencies, take 12 cabinet positions, move them back down to, to uh, eight. So those were five of the six goals. This, the sixth goal was what he wanted to do in the field of health care. And his sixth goal, as related to health, is actually number four here. And out there, he, he outlined the key things he wanted to do. Comprehensive health insurance for those who needed it. Expand the number of people being able to provide medical care. Establish and reform the financial aspects of medical care. He signed legislation after proposing it to expand the number of physicians, to expand the number of nations, uh, medical schools, to expand the number of nurses. He provided a program to move physicians and other healthcare workers into rural America where there were shortages and into inner city areas. He established health maintenance organizations, uh, was the first person to actually recognize health maintenance organizations. Patterned after a conversation he actually had with a Californian by the name of Edgar Kaiser back in the uh, late 1960s. And out of that, the whole uh, health maintenance organization grew. He worked very diligently to establish better standards for the care of the aged in nursing homes, increased uh, federal research efforts, particularly in areas that had been neglected, like sickle cell anemia. And he established the National Health Education Foundation to alert people on ways in which they could better care for themselves and do such things as, as do regular blood pressure screening, which back in the 60s and 70s, uh, high blood pressure was actually known as the silent killer because many Americans didn't realize they had it and weren't being treated or medicated for it. And he, working with the uh, National Heart Institute and with the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, established some of the public programs that used advertising and, and the television and magazines to encourage blood pressure screening. And it's fair to say, as you look back on that era with the people being treated today, that it had a factor, an unknown factor, but a factor in extending longevity. Um, in the brief time we have this afternoon, I, I've just highlighted two specific health programs that I'd like just to spend a minute on that highlight the President's interest in these two areas. It also highlights the role that the Domestic Council had in moving these two areas along. One of the uh, areas required legislation he proposed a program, and it was enacted. The second area required legislation. He proposed a program. There were hearings on it. It wasn't enacted. He proposed it again, and he proposed it a third year, and it still wasn't enacted. If it had been enacted, it should have been enacted, we wouldn't have the debacle that we've seen over the last 12 months in Washington regarding this whole debate on health insurance, because the health insurance problem and the health needs of Americans would have been solved 37 years ago but more about that in a few minutes. The first area that I would talk about and speak about and address is the uh, cancer field. In his development of his State of the Union message in 1971, 
the President wanted to talk about health insurance and health reform and health financing and health manpower. But he also <coughs> had a uh, birthday party in December of 1970 for an individual that he'd had a long relationship with and he wanted to do special something special for that individual. So he said, I'm going to th toss a birthday party for you and I'm going to do it at the White House. And do something for you that nobody else can do, at least in 1970. And so he had a birthday party and invited this individual and some of his friends there. The individual had been a founder of the American Cancer Society uh, many years before. And he talked to President Nixon about the opportunities that he thought there existed for additional work in the field of cancer, that there were things going on in molecular biology and some of the fields that, that needed expansion, that the National Cancer Institute was trying to do it, but they weren't doing it enough. Well, the president, in his own way, made a note of that and passed uh, a note to uh, Bob Halderman, who passed it to John Ehrlichman, who said, is there anything more that we should be doing in the cancer field? And within a day or two, I had a request about, could I look into this area? And so during the domestic pattern that we had set up, <coughs> the domestic council, we were in touch with the secretary of HEW, who was then Elliot Richardson, and the director of the National Cancer Institute, and the president's science advisor, and, and other individuals, and came together with a program that, yes, there would be some opportunities. We prepared a decision memorandum for the president, and went to the president. And within the day, I, I hadn't received an answer, but I did get a knock on my office door about 3 o'clock one afternoon. And, there was a fellow that introduced himself to me by the name of Bill Sapphire, who happened to be one of the president's speechwriters and passed away about six months ago after having a 27-year career as a columnist with the uh, New York Times. <coughs> Bill said he had just been with the president uh, down the hall and that the president, uh, he was helping him with prepare a State of the Union message and the president wanted to include the Cancer Research Initiative in the State of the Union message that he was to deliver two days later. And Bill said he had prepared a little language, and could I give it a look? And I did, and made a suggestion or two. And, and uh, that Friday evening, the president went before the Congress to deliver his six great goals speech. And the next day, the New York Times, in their own inimitable way, had the six great goals buried on the last page. But on page one was the uh, cancer initiative. It's remarkable in that many years it's been uh, referred to as a war on cancer. That was never used by the president, was never used in any of the materials we put out from the White House. It was something that just was picked up and, and caught on. And actually, it hasn't been a war. It's been a very slow, thoughtful, deliberative process of greater understanding of basic research, of moving uh, things along bit by bit. There haven't been any great breakthroughs. There haven't been any instant cures. There's been an awful lot of progress of knowledge, and an awful lot of people's lives have been extended and made better, but there's still a lot more to do and, and a lot of the work that's being supported by that and, and other programs since that time are moving uh, uh, that way. The, uh, there was a lot of debate in the Congress. Uh, Senator Kennedy had a bill to take the cancer effort outside of HEW and establish an independent agency. The president was against that. And most of the health and scientific organizations were against it. Some of the uh, organizations in the cancer field supported it. Um, the House Health Committee was generally against it. The Senate Committee, which Senator Kennedy chaired, obviously, was for it. Um, we had a great debate for six, seven months between uh, the White House and the House and the Senate on the substance of that bill. Um, Senator Kennedy took one position, the House took another. We t tended to side with the House. We had a good negotiation with that bill. I, as I think back upon it, I did some things which none of my White House colleagues have ever heard about and they'll hear about now for the first time, but I was finishing up a late lunch uh, in the White House mess one afternoon and had a call from the chairman of the health subcommittee in the House, a congressman from Florida by the name of Paul Rogers, who um, I had gotten to know when I had been at HEW and I thought he was a Democrat from the Palm Beach area, but very fair, honest uh, member of Congress and good to work with. And he said, Jim, uh, I've got a little bit of a problem. I said, well, can I help you with it? And he said, well, we really want to support the president's cancer legislation, and uh, we're in a session here right now. We have to go to conference with the Senate tomorrow. We want to support the president's position, but they really want to hear what the president wants. And I said, well, I, you know, we've sent letters up there. The president sent letters. You have our position. 
He said, they really want you to come up and, and, and tell, tell them what the president would want. And I said, well, you know, uh, Chairman, it's, a, it's such a thing as executive privilege, and <laughs> I, uh, I don't know that I am uh, in position to do that. And he said, well, let me put it this way. The president wants his bill, and he wants it the way he wants it. He wants it this year. I think you ought to strongly consider it. So within about 15 minutes, I was in a car and went up to the hill. He promised me that there would be no uh, stenographer, there would be no records of it, that uh, it would be an executive session. So I found my way into the main capital and found the committee where they were meeting, and went in and seated at the witness table and answered questions for about 30 minutes, none of which were related to the purpose of the program or why we needed it. They were all related to the specific provisions of the program and what the president would accept and what he wouldn't accept. And we laid out what it was. And the chairman said, well, thank you for coming. And we've got our marching orders as we go into executive session with the uh, Senate tomorrow to mark up the bill. And let's see what we can do. Well, they passed the bill. And it was a bill that the president wanted. And uh, signed into law two days before Christmas on December 23rd uh, in the state dining room at the White House. Um, but then there's a sequence to that bill that probably wouldn't have happened without the existence of a domestic council that had some access to what some of our colleagues in the National Security Council that Jeff referred to earlier um, had happened. During the first term, President Nixon decided to renounce the U.S. offensive use of biological weapons. And the U.S. had an extensive biological weapons program. Um, there were production facilities in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. There were also huge stockpiles of biological weapons maintained at Pine Bluff, Arkansas, as there were at the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal just north of uh, Denver. The development of these munitions and the things that they contained were put together by the Army Chemical Corps in a laboratory in Fort Detrick, Maryland, which is adjacent to uh, Frederick, Maryland, about 40 minutes from uh, Bethesda, Maryland, where the National Cancer Institute is, and about an uh, hour and a half from Washington. And I had become aware of, of that through some colleagues at the National Security Council, and then when it became public, and I asked the director of the National Cancer Institute, who, as we had done the work on the cancer mission, had told me he needed some, some additional laboratory, and they were short on space, whether he thought there would be anything at Fort Detrick that they could use. And he said, well, I'd have to take a look at it. So I called Mel Laird, who was then the Secretary of Defense, and arranged to go out there the following day, took the director with me, and we walked through the laboratories. He said, yeah, I think we could use these. We'd have to change a lot of things, because we're in the process of doing things that they weren't doing here. And uh, so we developed a position paper for the president. He uh, sent it over to the Secretary of Defense. To make a long story short, um, those laboratories were uh, transferred to the uh, National Cancer Institute, um, and the president helicoptered out, uh, I believe it was October 19, 1971, to Fort Detrick and made the announcement, and the conversion occurred about six months later. Today, those uh, facilities are actively part of the National Cancer Institute. The, um, uh, there are some 64 acres involved, about 100 buildings. Some of the contract work actually is done by an outside agency down in San Diego called uh, SIC. But most of the work being done by the National Cancer Institute staff, they're manufacturing drugs there, they're manufacturing vaccines, they've got a whole section on molecular biology, they're making great in inroads on developing new information. And in addition to the internal work they're doing, the NIH cancer program now runs all of their worldwide grant programs from uh, what had been Fort Detrick, Maryland, which is now called um, NCI Frederick. Um, I go back to a point I made earlier. I think without the existence of the Domestic Council and being able to interchange ideas back and forth among the White House staff, it was a great accomplishment by the President. The, uh, one other comment about this, and I want to move into the second area that Jeff's asked me to uh, comment about. Um, one of the things President Nixon referred to as he got out on the campaign trail in 1973, I, uh, in F-72, I was with him at one point when he talked about the conversion of Fort Detrick, and he said that at the time we were out there in October of 71, 
that he wanted to open its gates to the world and have people come by and see the peaceful uses that we had turned this project to. And about a year later, the Russian Ministry of Health came to the U.S. and went out to Fort Detrick to sit down with the people in cancer research and see what was, what was going on. And, and the president referred to it when he was, uh, in his radio address that he made on November the 3rd, 1972, it was the last radio address he made. It was a Friday afternoon before the 1972 election. And, and he said in that release that the uh, Russian Minister of Health here once stood in a place that had been symbol of a closed world, a world, a world of suspicion and confrontation, a place where some of the best minds of our nation had prepared for a possible war against his nation. Now this same place had become the symbol of an open world, a world of cooperation and trust. It had become a meeting ground where the best minds from many nations could work together to save life everywhere on Earth. Um, today, Fort Detrick, as I mentioned, uh, is close to the NIH campus, and they're doing some exciting work there, and we continue to, uh, from afar, watch it and, and uh, feel quite comfortable about what they're up to. Um, the second area I'd like to spend just a few closing minutes on is talking about the area I initially talked about at the onset, and that is national health insurance. The president, right from the beginning of his administration, had some great concern about health insurance and wanted to do something about it. Now, here is a president that, for his career, had opposed Medicare. This is the first Republican president, upon taking office, inherited a Medicare program that he had opposed all the time he had been in Congress. It had been enacted in July of 1965, had been implemented in 1966, and he became president in 1968. And so many faces started to look to Washington and look to what he was going to do about it, if anything. And I might say, at the time he became president, and these reviews started to occur, even the most ardent supporters of the Medicare program were amazed at the way the costs had taken off and escalated out of sight, and they watched and wondered what the new president was going to do. Well, other than some of the financial reforms that I mentioned earlier, he put in place like health maintenance organizations, he uh, <coughs> decided not to touch it. But he was concerned about the whole area. And he was concerned, as we look back his notes in some of the meetings that I had the privilege of sitting in, uh, concerned about three things. He was obviously concerned about the health issue as it related to the upcoming uh, 1972 election. He was also concerned about it because Senator Kennedy had a very comprehensive, compulsive health insurance bill, not unlike what's now in Washington today being debated, and the President had been opposed to that right from the beginning of his career in the Congress going back to 1946. Um, but the third thing that kept coming up in meetings that I had the privilege of sitting through with him was a concern that he had <coughs> about some of the things that his family had been through right here in Yorba Linda with his brother Arthur and uh, his brother Harold and the trips that his mother had to make to go to Arizona with Harold and, you know, they lost Arthur. And I remember one day sitting with the president of the American Medical Association. We were talking about trying to get a coalition together to support the uh, comprehensive health insurance bill that the president had uh, introduced and he started to talk about that and said, you know, there's some reasons we need to do this and he said, I've been against these programs but I'm not against a program that takes the best of the medical care system in the United States, combines it under a private approach with a public approach and if we can piece that together, I'd like to do it. So he had a program that was developed in 1972, it was called the Family Health Insurance Plan and it went part of the way. It had a program that anyone with incomes uh, under $5,000 would be guaranteed coverage. They would cont contribute to part of the cost. Part of it would be carried by the states. And uh, it didn't go anywhere. We talked about it. There were some hearings. He talked about it in the 72 campaign. It didn't move. And then in 73, he decided to take another crack at it. And at that point, he instructed Cap Weinberger. You heard Cap referred to earlier. Cap had been uh, Governor Reagan's budget director when the governor was here in California. Cap, at the first term of the Nixon administration, became director of the Federal Trade Commission, and then went on became director of the Office of Management and Budget. And then the president asked him to go over to be Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. And Cap, as many of you know from California, 
later in President Reagan's term became Secretary of Defense. The President asked CAP to head up an interagency task force, including domestic council staffing, to put together a health insurance plan, and CAP did. He worked very carefully at it, developed something called the Comprehensive Health Plan of 1974. Um, it involves some of the areas that I mentioned earlier. It would have covered everyone. It would have done everything that the current programs in Washington are now being done, except it would have done it through a private-public partnership. It wouldn't have required excessive federal money. It would have been done for a total additional cost, again now this is 1974 dollars, not 10 days dollars, of five billion dollars. If that act had been passed 37 years ago, um, we wouldn't have the debate that we've got in the country today. It came very close. Uh, the President had talked to Wilbur Mills, who was then chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Senator Kennedy got involved in it. There was a coalition that got put together that start meeting evenings on Capitol Hill. They were drafting legislation. It was pretty much along the lines of what the President had proposed. And then Senator Kennedy had a meeting one day with the presidents of the national unions, the AFL, CIO, the auto workers, and told them what he was thinking. And they said, look, you know, we, we've got complete coverage now by the auto workers, by the, the companies that employ our unions. We've negotiated these, and now you're talking about, you know, backing away from part of that. We're not going to support it. So the senator pulled back his support on it. Some other things began to happen in Washington during the summer and fall of 1974. And the opportunity that, that was provided just sort of slipped away. I've heard uh, many times and seen in print Kennedy, Senator Kennedy and others who were involved in that program um, said that, you know, they would regret that it hadn't been acted because if it had, the problems, again, that are being discussed in Washington wouldn't be there. And uh, we would have had a great opportunity to, to move ahead move ahead. That was one of the many meetings the President had. That was with Cap Weinberger. I would guess during uh, 1974, probably going back to look at the White House logs, we probably had 25, 30 meetings with the comprehensive health insurance issue on the table because he was most interested in it, wanted to see enacted, was disappointed it hadn't been enacted, but thank you very much for your attention. I just wanted to give you two examples of programs that were involved in to pick up on the theme that Jeff had said, some of the things the Domestic Council has done, and look forward to any questions you might have later in the afternoon. Thank you. Good evening. Before I talk about the environment, I just want to share two personal anecdotes with you that have to do with this library. I was in uh, Nova Scotia at my summer cottage, late 70s, I guess, and this mellifluous Everett Dirksen voice with a California accent with unmistakably Richard Nixon on the phone. And he said, John, how about doing a last hurrah for me? Find me a library site. And that was the beginning of a long thing which Gavin Herbin knows all about. We went all over the place, San Clemente, Whittier, Al Irvine Ranch and all that. And we finally ended up with a ranch there. The other anecdote was the architect was a fellow named Ernie Wilson. And Ernie and I got on a conference call with the president, and Ernie really hadn't talked to many presidents in the United States before, so he was a little intimidated being on the phone. And uh, I said, sir, uh, Mr. Wilson and I have the architectural drawings done. We're going to FedEx them to you, and would you and Mrs. Nixon please focus on looking them over, because after, we, after you lock it in, we don't want any more changes, because it's going to be very costly and all that. What's it look like, John? What's this place look like? And I said, well, sir, it's, a, it's, kind, of, it's kind of nice. It's, a kind of, it's got a Spanish hacienda. It's got an orange tile roof. There's his silence on the phone. And he says, I bet it looks like another damn California shopping center. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the library got built, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. Now the environment. Back in 68 in the Nixon-Humphrey campaign, uh, neither candidate really paid much attention to the environment. Uh, Nixon gave one speech. Uh, the main subject, of course, were peace. Uh, the, the Cold War was still going on. Jobs, the normal th one or two top things that any polls that any candidate would talk about, not the environment. Nixon gave one small speech that mentioned the environment. Hubert Humphrey dedicated a park in San Antonio and another one in in Oregon, but nothing much on the environment. And I don't think anybody in the Nixon staff could even remember the press asking a question about it. Now, it's hard to believe that 17 months later, after the election on Earth Day, April 22, 1970, there's this huge national 
outpouring for the environment called Earth Day. The next morning, the New York Times headline said, quote, millions join Earth Day to Earth Day observance across the nation. And the Washington Post said, Earth Day stirs the nation. Now, how did all this frenzied reaction that was going on, what did the White House do about it at that time? Well, the cabinet went out and made a lot of speeches, just like the congressmen were doing, speaking were all over the place. The White House staff did a cleanup, picked up all the styrofoam cups on the Potomac River there, and we got a wire photo shot for it. But that was it. But RN was silent on the issue. As a matter of fact, I was pushing hard for him to have an Earth Day proclamation. Believe it or not, on that Earth Day, we had a proclamation that said National Ar Archery Week or some damn thing like that. It had nothing to do with the, with the environment. And the reason RN was quiet about it was he, first of all, he'd already done a message to Congress with a, su a very substantive message to Congress on this stuff. And he f also felt this proclamation was a bit of grandstanding. And then he also worried about the cost of the environment, which nobody was talking about at that time. So there wasn't much doubt about it that on Earth Day, Nixon took a political licking. Uh, Walter Cronkite said, quote, Earth Day crowds predominantly young, white, and anti-Nixon. Dan Rather characterized the White House attitude on Earth Day as, quote, benign neglect. Well, how did all this happen? Well, you can trace it in the polls. If you go back to May of 1968, uh, and ask the question, is, is this or that important? National security and jobs are always number one and two, like they still are for the most part. But only 1% of the country said that they thought Earth Day was important. Yet on May of 1970, 25% thought it was the most important thing. It was right up there just behind national security. Remember, the Cold War was going on then, and jobs. Uh, a terrific spike in the polls that our White House pollster said he'd never seen anything like it. Why did this happen? To this day, nobody really knows. Uh, certainly Rachel Carlson's Silent Spring was a thing that started to get it seeping into the conscience of the Navy, of the nation. Another thing was probably affluence. Uh, this was getting beyond the point where we were dealing with the bread and butter kind of issues that came and the booming economy that started after World War II. People could begin to worry about things that weren't right up front in their lives and that there was a, a, a lot of advocates, a, a lot of reason for, that, for, for them to think the environment was important. And the journalism, it, it became, there was a period there after Earth Day when almost every day in the Washington of the papers, you'd see an environment story, some kind of environment story all the time. It just never stopped, uh, never stopped. Then science was a big thing. Science about things you couldn't see. Clean air and dirty air. Radiation metal, metals, radiation, chlorinated hydrocarbons, whatever that was. All these things were going on. The press was talking and was like a pollinating bee, bringing it back to people and it was going back and forth. These are some of the reasons, although I've never really put my finger on it, what it was that made the environment spike so in the polls, but it certainly did. So what was Nixon's uh, message about? What, what the main thing about it was its completeness. And there were 37 different points in this, uh, in this message. Uh, 23 of them were new legislative proposals that had to be approved by Congress and 14 executive orders where we could actually do something without referring to Congress. The main thing was uh, a fundamental reorganization of the government and how did we get EPA. It's hard to remember this now, but at the time, before EPA existed, departments, various departments, bureaus, etc., were scattered all through the government. There were 44 agencies and bureaus, et cetera, and offices that had something to do with the environment scattered through nine departments. Now you talk about chaos to run something, you can't do that. Nixon listened to the cabinet officers uh, who were very anxious, frankly, to protect their own turf for the most part. <coughs> Typical example, what are we gonna do about pesticide? The environmental people said, boy, let's ban DDT. Secretary of Agriculture says, wait a minute, the cotton people with DDT, we don't wanna do that. And then somebody else, Hickel, wanted to ban DDT on the public lands. It was back and forth. Business regulations, Paul McCracken at the Council of Environmental Quality, Bob Mayo, the uh, 
director of the budget, and Mari stands, commerce, they, well, wait a minute, let's not mess up business, you know. And AIR, AIR was in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare with Bob Finch, but Hickel wanted it over in his department because he already had water. Then we had a low polluting car in there, and we, Volpe over at Transportation wanted to run it, and Finch wanted to keep it with his AIR over at, uh, so it was chaos, it went on that way. So anyway, he finally, decided on a, he looked at a Department of Environment and Natural Resources, a Department of Energy and Environment and Natural Resources, and an EPA. And the reason we went to EPA, Jeff alluded to it, there was a law then, that no longer the president has this authority, but there was a law in those days that said, if the president proposes an agency, not a department, but an agency, meaning something smaller than a department, and Congress doesn't do something about it in 60 days, it becomes law. And that's how we got EPA done, and that's how we got the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Department done. Well, what were the Nixon uh, highlights? What were the main things that he really accomplished? We got, uh, he signed bills which gave us a fresh Clean Water Act, which is still on the books, another Clean Air Act, tougher regulations for pesticides, we stopped ocean dumping, a practice in those days the oil tankers were flushing out their their oil, you know, with what was left after they pumped it out and right into the sea, things like that. Strip mining for coal, that was finally stopped. Um, better environmental restrictions on mining, better restrictions on offshore drilling after the Santa Barbara oil spill, which you sure all remember well. One of his big initiatives was parks, and I guess if there was one thing the president cared more about in this environmental package, it was parks. He used to often talk about how when he was here in Yorba Linda and Whittier in this area, that you know the, the rich kids could get in the car with their parents and they go up to Yellowstone or something like that, but the poor kids, they didn't get a car and there's no way they could get to Yellowstone, so how are we gonna get parks closer to people? So that became a big, a big thing with him, and it was, it was in his gut. When we get to these discussions about clean air and all that, his eyes would glaze over once in a while, but when we were talking about parks, he was really in there strong on the parks. It was really a, uh, a thing with him. But then we got ourselves in trouble in parks for a little bit. Wally Hickel came up with a proposal which basically said, Mr. President, we've got to buy more national parks, but why should one generation pay for these parks? We'll let all the generations in the future pay for it, so let's have a long-term bond system to finance it. So Nixon was attracted with this proposal. So he told Bob Mayo at, at uh, Budget and John Early, let's see if you can work a deal out. Well, that's the way it worked, and uh, the trouble was, uh, months later, we're sitting in the State of the Union, and we hear Nixon say, I shall propose new, finding methods, new financing methods for open spaces and parklands. Ehrlichman and I looked at each other. It wasn't in the last one we sent up to Camp David the night before when he was working on his State of the Union. He had obviously put this in himself, but we had never been able to figure out a way how to finance this thing. So that was kind of a problem. What were we going to do about that? Well, the answer was something called the Property Review Board, and it was really quite a system. The G General Services Administration kind of buys and sells things for the government, but when they're trying to take property away from somebody, uh, they don't have a lot of political clout with the, with the cabinet. And the Department of Defense, in particular, had enormous amounts of acreage. Much of it was not really being used for any particular military purpose. So they set, the, set up this Property Review Board which basically had a tilt to it and said, well, if you have federal land and you're not sure when you're using it, when in doubt, let's make a park out of it. That's what it said through all the language. And they put Bryce Harlow in charge of it. I don't know if any of you remember the name Bryce Harlow, but he was a very wonderful you know, White House staffer under Eisenhower and later under Nixon. And putting his name on this thing kind of made the cabinet officers realize this is real clout, you know. So, but even so, Bryce had to draft a lot of letters over to, particularly Mel Laird, we'd, we'd say to Mel, give us X, he had all kinds of land over there in the Department of Defense. And we get a memo back that thick of the justification why they had to keep it for World War VI, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so then they'd write another letter, but the net result was Nixon created 642 parks worth millions and millions of dollars out of federal land and they're closer to people 
kind of did the best he could to satisfy his thing about the poor guys who couldn't go up to Yosemite to the point where he wanted to put a subsidy to go to the Golden Gate Bridge, not Golden Gate, but the New York uh, City Park right outside of New York. He wanted to put a subway subsidy in there so the 25 cents could be given to the poor kid to ride out to the park. Well, bureaucratically, there was no way in God's world we could figure out how to do that, so we finally talked him out of it. But that's how strongly he felt about that. So one more, all these decisions weren't done on scientific option papers, you know. One I remember in particular was the returnable bottle. The, the idea was the federal law, like many states and cities right now have, you, you take the Coke bottle, you pay, you, you pay another nickel, and you get the nickel back when you take the bottle back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he calls me in there with Ehrlichman, and uh, he says, and I'll try to reconstruct the conversation. He says, uh, how many jobs involved in this? And I said, well, there's about 6,000 people that lose their jobs because we're going to make a lot less bottles. But, you know, Mr. President, there's about 6,000 people who are going to get jobs because they're cleaning the bottles, they're transporting them, and all that. John, the 6,000 that lose their job, who's going to tell them, you or me? <laughs> well, I felt kind of politically dumb. Here I was like an inside the beltway guy talking this way. Then the next statement was astounding. He says to Ehrlichman to me, he says, you know those beehive hairdo, hairdos that women are wearing now? He called them, he didn't use the word beehive, he called them anti-gravity hairdos. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, why are we talking about hairdos in the middle of this bottle conversation? But you know, I'm just an aide to the president, so I keep my mouth shut. And he's going on, he says, you know what's gonna happen? He says about Wednesday, those girls, those ladies all go to the hairdressers, and they get their hair fixed up. And now it's Friday afternoon, and they're getting a little worried because they're going to a dinner party Friday night, but their hair's starting to come down already, and they're mad and kind of angry to start with. And plus that, they're in the station wagon, and they're picking up their kids, and the kids are screaming in the back seat. And then in back of that, there's all these bottles rattling around back down. <laughs> these bottles, and he says, damn it, he says, you're just going to call them Nixon bottles. We're not going to have it. <laughs> and and to, this day, there's, to this day, there's no, uh, there's no environmental, uh, no more legislation that way. Well, anyway, I think this, uh, the legacy of what Nixon left is, is uh, only a bureaucratic way to say it. He institutionalized the environment. Um, an analogy would be this. Uh, people don't talk that much about the environment like they did at Earth to time of Earth Day. But um, I don't know, it's kind of hard to say. You take uh, Social Security, for example. You don't hear people talking about Social Security much. But if you mess with it, bang, right away you hear about it. It's the same with the environment now. So he institutionalized it that way. So just in closing, I would say the, and I think I'm fair and say this, he had a record equal or better than Theodore Roosevelt or any president of the United States when it came to the environment. Thanks very much. A few who are left here. <laughs> I have to tell you that uh, the reason that I'm last is that energy came last in the Nixon administration. <laughs> Uh, you may have heard Jim Cavanaugh talk about uh, the six major pieces of the 1971 State of the Union. You didn't hear energy in there. No. No United States President had ever said word one substantively about the topic of energy until Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon had his first energy statement to the Congress June 4, 1971. Unprecedented, an energy message. He said two major things we have to do. We have to find new sources of energy, and uh, we have to find sources that will not pollute, because he had taken to heart uh, the kinds of studies and thoughts and processes he'd gone through that John Whitaker was talking about. He'd internalized this environmental thing as well, set up the Environmental Protection Agency, set up the Council of, of, uh, uh, on Environmental Quality, and he had taken it aboard. And I remember uh, we had a meeting just before the uh, annual environmental message, just before he did this energy message, and he had Russ Train, who was the head of the Council of Environmental Quality, in with the president, and uh, the usual suspects, you know, Whitaker and me and us evil staff people, and the president said something substantive to Russell Train, the only time I can remember this happening, and Russell Train is in the edge of his chair, and the president says, I was down with uh, Bibi Rebozo in Key Biscayne last weekend, 
And I noticed that almost every car on those freeways in Miami only had one person in the car. He says the roads are getting crowded, we've got to do something uh, to encourage people out of their cars into mass transit. Russ, train, you go out there and tell them this is a major priority. Train is so excited the president has told him to do something. So he goes running out to, to brief, the, brief the White House press and he says, ladies and gentlemen, President Nixon has asked me to tell you that he was in, Flor uh, he's in California, in Florida with Bibi Rebozo and he found out that three out of four cars only have one driver. <laughs> and, uh, and just like you, just like you, the audience cracks up and Russ Train says, what's so funny about that? His moment in the sun and he blew it. That's why Russ Train is not here with us today. <laughs> but I have to tell you, we who are dealing with energy you know, as a topic in the, in the uh, Nixon administration were really lucky because Jim Cavanaugh had to worry about how do we change and how we reform health care as they're doing now and we were going to reform how we dealt with our labor laws and the reformation of this and reformation of that. Not in energy, folks. We were writing on a blank slate. And the president wrote mighty damn well because there were three major things we had to address in energy policy. He starts in June of 1971. Okay, we've got to worry about what our policies are, what our institutions are, and let's put some people in place to do it. And so you go back and look, which I did coming out here and ridding myself for this, at uh, the president's energy statements. 1971, he says, we have got to develop new sources of energy, right? An adequate supply of clean energy. And he came up with a whole bunch of initiatives that we were going to press to do that. Reduce sulfur oxide emissions, coal gasification so we can have clean coal, uh, fusion, nuclear fusion, the next generation of nuclear power, something called magnetohydrodynamics, which only Whitaker will remember, well, which was a kind of a dead end we drove down, but that was a alternate energy. People are talking about alternate energy now, we were talking about it then. And uh, we were going to speed federal leases for oil and gas drilling on federal lands offshore and onshore. And uh, we were going to have a new structure, as you have heard from John Whitaker, the Department of Energy and Natural Resources, uh, to coordinate this. Pretty comprehensive stuff. And uh, by George, if you have a president deliver a State of the Union uh, speech today, he is going to mention, that he or she is going to mention energy, for sure, and they're going to say, we have to develop clean coal, we have to do something about oil and gas, we have to have nuclear, da-da-da-da-da. It is not going to be radically different from what President Nixon said in the very first one in 1971. The next time the president addressed uh, energy was in April of 73. And he was the first one again, I hate to keep repeating this, but he was the first one to have something called a national energy policy. And uh, what did he say? He said, well, we've got to have coal, we've got to have oil, we've got to have natural gas, we have to develop our outer continental shelf, we have to have nuclear, and for the first time, we have to have an Alaska pipeline. Now, this was 1973, folks. We're talking about the world really being very nervous about wars in the Middle East, and our foreign uh, reliance on oil and things like that. And here's our big natural resource, which we've just discovered in Prudhoe Bay, have to build a pipeline to get it down to the United States. And so the president says, oh boy, big initiative is uh, the Alaska pipeline. So he sends legislation up, high priority. And uh, in the middle of this very nervous period, Ted Stevens, the uh, senator from Alaska, I happen to be in his office, and Stevens says, you know, we keep having these, these studies uh, required by the National Environmental Policy Act to uh, stop our national, or, or really and as the effect of stopping the development of this pipeline, isn't there some way we can cut this bureaucratic umbilical cord? And I said, well, you guys in Congress passed the National Environmental Policy Act, but as uh, was mentioned by my friend Shepard, I'm a recovering lawyer, and I said, but we could write a law. <laughs> and so we sat in Ted Stevens' office, and we wrote a really one sentence law, and it says, uh, the studies undertaken to look at this proposed uh, Alaska pipeline are sufficient as done, no more is needed. Law. And so Ted Stevens puts it forward, the Republicans basically support it, the Democrats basically don't go back and forth, and it ends up in a tie, 49 to 49 tie, broken by Spiro T. Agnew, the only vote he cast as Vice President of the United States, and that's the only reason we have 
an Alaska natural um, an gas oil pipeline today. Uh, a very uh, closely run thing. So also in 1973, the president for the first time talked about the international aspect of energy. We had only been talking about domestic energy before. This time, uh, he, ta oh, he talked about conservation, by the way, I would tell you. Uh, people think that that was invented by somebody else. Uh-uh. That was a Nixon initiative. Lots of, environment, lots of conservation initiatives. I won't go into each one. Look them up. I did myself. It's good for you. Uh, but on the international, he said we've got to coordinate with OECD, the Organization of the Rich Guys. We have to coordinate with EEC. EU didn't uh, exist at that stage. It was the European Economic uh, Council and with the Soviets on various pieces of energy. And then he said he was going to set up something called the Oil Policy Committee. And that was not something in the Interior Department. It was not something in, uh, uh, that was going to be assigned in the future to the Department of Energy and Natural Resources. This was in the Treasury Department uh, under George Shultz uh, and his deputy, Bill Simon. And that's where uh, he put the coordination of the Oil Policy Committee because it had the international implications. And, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger uh, started to play in the energy game. Henry, Henry didn't even know what energy was. He couldn't spell it when we started this. And I remember Ehrlichman sent me to a meeting uh, with George Schultz and Henry Kissinger to talk about where we were going to go in this international stuff. And we started talking about some very highly classified things. And I'm a poor domestic guy. I mean, I had a, I had a security clearance to read the newspaper in the morning, and that was it. <laughs> and so I'm sitting at this meeting, and I've never met Henry Kissinger before in my life. I'm sitting there like this, you know, it's famous curmudgeon. And uh, so he's in this very, very classified affair. And all of a sudden, he, it's a little round table. And he looks across the table at me and he says, what was your name? And I couldn't remember. And I said, <laughs> totally. And so, and so uh, George Schultz leans over. Uh, George Schultz le leans over and he pouts a Kissinger like this. And he says, it's OK, Henry. He's sitting in for John Ehrlichman. And Kissinger says, all right. So I come out of the meeting, go back to my office, and Ehrlichman calls me up and says, well, what was that meeting about? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know how we lived through those days, but we did. So uh, the president then, next, next addresses energy, not very many months later, in the fall of 1973. Now we're in the middle, fall of 1973, of the big fight. Uh, Israel has been invaded. We're having a Middle East war. Arabs cut off the oil. We go into crisis mode. So the president comes out with an energy crisis speech. And he has one of my all-time favorite lines. He says, we have an energy crisis, but there's no crisis of the American spirit. And, but then he says, we are going to, we ask everybody, doesn't require it, ask everybody to turn down the thermostat, says you're healthier at 65 to 68 degrees anyway, and asks them, he doesn't require a federal mandate, please don't drive your cars faster than 50 miles an hour, and uh, we're going to go to uh, daylight savings time all year round and some things like this. And one of the reasons he said we really have to worry about this is that our unemployment rate is just about to cross 4.5%. <laughs> wow, that was really tough. Can you imagine that high an unemployment rate? That would do drastic things. Uh, so everybody thinks Jimmy Carter invented this whole thing about put on your sweater, turn down your thermostat, lower the speed limits. No. Richard Nixon, but Richard Nixon didn't have this feeling of malaise in the country, he didn't make everybody feel badly. He says, we don't have a crisis of spirit, we're going to get through this, a little bit of help from everybody, we'll be great. And so I think the whole feeling uh, that President Nixon put across, the way he addressed it, not just the substantive initiatives, but the way he presented it and his own personality in selling it, uh, made him a very interesting uh, uh, juxtaposition uh, with President Carter a few years later. Now, one other thing that he had in that speech, perhaps the most famous single phrase of Richard Nixon in energy policy, was toward the end of the speech, he said, I propose, just as John Kennedy challenged this country to go to the moon in one decade, I challenge this country to get rid of our dependence on foreign oil 100% uh, by 1980. I challenge you, I'm going to call it Project Independence. Okay. Now, us staffy guys writing all these uh, option papers for the president, writing drafts of the speeches as we send them over across from the old executive office building where our office was, across the little alleyway over to the West Wing, we would send our drafts over. They would come back with this, this phrase, uh, Project Independence. 
And uh, we would cross it out again because we had no idea how to cut off all oil imp imports by 1980. This is 1973. And it would keep getting put back in. So finally I called up Haldeman and I said, Bob, how in the world does this keep getting put back in this speech? He says, the old man's putting it. And I said, he gets to. It was personally done. Richard Nixon says, we got to challenge the country. And he was right. I mean, we didn't know how to do it substantively, but the idea of focusing people's minds on how important energy was and worrying about oil imports and that kind of thing, we didn't solve the problem. Every president since then has said we got to cut off or reduce or whatever in some way oil imports, and we haven't gotten there yet. But the fact that we're trying, we're moving in that direction, keeps it at the top of the agenda and means it's important. Well, I could go in for a few more hours because I like this energy stuff. Uh, <laughs> I worked with John Whitaker on the environmental things as well, but uh, uh, energy was so much fun and it was so much, uh, it was such an exciting time to be part of it because we're writing on this blank slate, we knew it was incredibly important and it wasn't going to go away. So if you look back, I said at the start, we were going to talk about policy and institutions and people. Well, we get to people. We were going to set up something in the White House to focus on energy. And Mel Laird had come over from the Defense Department at this stage and had become counselor to the President. And so Mel Laird says to me, we've got to create a new little policy office here in the White House. Uh, we had an uh, energy subcommittee of the Domestic Council, but we decided we needed a greater focus on that. Had brought in a guy named Governor Love of, of uh, uh, Colorado. And uh, so Laird says, let's set up something and we'll call it the Office of Energy Policy. And I said, we can't do that. He says, why not? And I said, because just last week we got rid of uh, the Office of Emergency Preparedness, OEP, and no bureaucrat will understand if we have a new OEP tomorrow and we'll mess ourselves up entirely. He says, all right, wise guy, what should we call it? And I said, Federal Energy Office. He says, done. And so we set up the Federal Energy Office, and at first was Governor Love. He didn't go through the crisis of the Arab oil embargo very well. He was then replaced by Bill Simon, our first energy czar. The only time I, I remember anybody in our Nixon administration being a czar, it's been cloned a few times in more current times. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that institution became Federal Energy Office, Federal Energy Administration, then Department of Energy. That's what it spawned. So we didn't have Department of Energy and Natural Resources, as we talked about, but we had the Department of Energy growing out of the initiatives that we set up. But the policies were the right focus all the way through, continue to be. The institutions were foreseen. Uh, by President Nixon and the focus that he had put on the institutions have followed along as they should have because they were right in my view. Uh, and the people have changed, but uh, uh, the kinds of people that we have today are a very different group of people that we started with. When we started worrying about energy policy, who could we turn to? We turned to the President's National Science Advisor, we, talked to the, we turned to the National Science Foundation, we turned to the Council on Environmental Quality, and uh, uh, and then, of course, the Secretary of Interior, as John Whitaker said, who was later, later number two in the Department of Interior. Uh, the Department of Interior had a bureaucratic interest here, and uh, agriculture had one here, and that kind of thing. That never works. But uh, the oversight that was created by the institution of uh, the organizations that Jeff Shepard started us off about uh, allowed President Nixon, who sits there and, and you know, knows what he wants to do, has a target and a focus, tells us all these little staffers to carry it out and expects us to do it. It was so exciting, it was so much fun. I will never have more fun. I was in my 20s, uh, I'm really old now, but I wasn't that old then. And even John Whitaker wasn't the old guy then. <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to talking to you further. What a walk down memory lane. Uh, uh, this started 40 years ago. As you know, the papers are coming out in June, 42 million pages of presidential documents. <clears throat> we have documents from the Civil War, and we can tell you what general went where, but what we don't have is interviews with the generals afterwards about why did you do that and how did you think it worked. And we have this benefit because of uh, younger people on President Nixon's staff uh, who can explain what the papers meant and how things came about. And what we're doing working with the library and, and an oral history project is putting together panels now to talk about policy development and what was attempted under the Nixon administration and its effect. 
This was the introductory panel. We expect to have panels roughly monthly on these and other topics. I hope you will join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.